Hey everybody, welcome to Losing Your Mind with Chris Cosentino. I'm your host, Chris Cosentino. We are here to talk about people that inspire and all my guests are inspiring in so many different ways. And I'm really looking forward to digging deep into how they got to where they are, to the top of their game, how hard they've worked, how much they've given up and how they're giving back. So without further ado, here's our next guest. Hey everybody, welcome to Losing Your Mind with Chris Cosentino. I am here with my good friend, Philip Spear, who is in Austin, uh, chef owner of Commodore. Um, God, we've known each other, what, how many years now? Over a decade, for sure. I'd say it's like- 15. 15. Yeah, 15, 15 years or so. Yeah. Yeah, a long time. It's been, um, you know, we, the first time Philip and I met, I was actually traveling to Austin to go out to Broken Arrow Ranch and hunt. Mm -hmm. And I came in to have dinner at Uchi. And at Uchi. That was a, a really, really great experience. I mean, you and I sat and talked for hours that night. Absolutely. Um, yeah, um, Uchi was such a, such a great place or time in my career to meet so many amazing people, uh, yourself included, and many, many more. And I, I, I will never forget that or, or take that for granted. It was, it's interesting because, you know, you were the pastry chef, yet you had your hands in every bit of as much of savory as you did <laughs> sweet. And I think, you know, yourself, there's people like Sam Mason, Alex Stupak, you know, people like that have always inspired me because you've, you've been, there's, you see so much more and it's such a, a broader scope. Whereas you have a caveman like myself who can only cook <laughs> savory, um, <laughs> but it's, it's really was really fun to watch you bounce between all those different things. It was, it was eye opening and pretty incredible. Um, so let's kind of like dig, you know, like we can start. I mean, there's so many different places we can start, right? Um, I want to first off, thank you because when you spoke out openly with the chef's feed video about your life choices and your changes, um, th I think the, within the first five minutes that that film hit, I was on the phone with you talking about your experience doing it, being open about it. And that was the catalyst for me to speak as well about my craziness uh or my inability to control my my mental health and you know you really inspired that freedom and openness that i was petrified of so um i mean if, if you're comfortable with starting there i think it'd be really yeah. absolutely I, and i think about that phone call a lot um, and have over the last seven years um also a huge shout out to roxanne and blake um uh for, for for running that that series and and really kind of digging into to, to that and what's amazing is like think about where we are today versus that phone call and you know for me at that moment when i had uh they actually aired it a year after it was it was like a year to the date of my sobriety um and and, and after it was produced and then think about where we are today for, with our openness and kind of public vulnerability versus to where we were then we're like oh are we talking about this shit like is this where we are okay was it cool did you, do you feel okay do you feel like totally violated uh, and you know they were so mindful about the way they did it and it felt good and you know as you expressed to me you know you saw it and it inspired you uh, which again like i said to this day is an amazing amazing thing and yeah, just look where we are. What is that? Six years, six years later now, uh, at this point, um, and how? I mean, you're doing a podcast, reaching out and, to people and touching in on that, checking in on that openness and vulnerability, and having conversations about all of this and about our mental, our mental places <laughs> where we are right now. So, it's it's pretty amazing, really. I mean, it's a. I mean, that moment. I think for me, I sat there because we. we we met at Uchi, we had done countless events together all over the country. I mean, whether it was Sobe, whether it was in Portland at Feast, whether it was New York. I mean, we've done so many events together where we weren't, maybe we weren't cooking together, but we were in, you know, hanging out, doing things. And I think about all the fun times we had, but it was definitely that moment when that 
when that video dropped, it, it was a shift. It shifted everything in my head like, okay, it, it's okay. Cause like, you know, you and I grew up in a very, you know, skateboard background, you know, mm. fall down, get up, fall down, get up, fall down, get up. <laughs> you take the breaks, and you're comfortable with it. Um, but to be, sure. to talk about it was never really okay. No, you're, you're absolutely right. And it's funny, my partner recently, she made a comparison to that when we were, she has a 10 year old, she has two sons, but one of them 10 year old. And we're like, you know, maybe we should talk to him a little bit more about your background. So he has kind of a deeper understanding of where you come from, because that's exactly right. It was that it was fall down, get up, keep going, shut your fucking mouth. And not in a like, not in a militant way, like, but in a way of just like, the fucking crybabies, let's go, <laughs> you know? And, uh, and that's a very different way of growing up. And, I mean, today I, I have two children. Uh, my partner has two younger children, you know, and, and just watching the difference between the six-year-old all the way up to the 22-year-old is, is wild. It's a lot. I mean, my son's 16 and I'm like- 16, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's pivotal. These moments are pivotal. And it's like, how do our reactions interact with them and how does it shape them? negatively or positively and hopefully mm -hmm. it's positive not negative hopefully <laughs> like oh my god am i gonna send my kid to therapy too um <laughs> did i create that did i, I mean that issue i always wonder if we're if we're doing it right maybe we are sending our children to therapy even i mean you know there's a thought of like you're doing it wrong your children not need therapy but if we're doing it right like <laughs> for someone have them someone to check in on right or to check in with so so I mean, you've, you've led so many people to make change now. And I think, you know, you're, you have a running club, the Commodore Run Club. Mm -hmm. um, you work with Ben's Friends, which is an amazing organization for hospitality folks to, mm -hmm. to address um, both, you know, mental and, and sobriety issues, uh, yeah. which I think is incredible. And there's chapters. And can you tell everybody a little bit about Ben's Friends? How it works and absolutely bench friends is it's it's on its fourth year now um and you know the kind of one of the many silver lining or one of the silver linings for many of us in the pandemic was this ability to to kind of get on and virtually connect with people and bench friends went from being in i think 11 cities when the pandemic hit uh having a daily meeting so 11 meetings a week to now 22 23 meetings a week some of them on Zoom, nationally led meetings from, from people like myself, um, you know, many chefs all over the country, restaurant professionals, not just chefs, uh, just hospitality professionals, and then also in-person meetings. And so it's just, a, it's, a, it's a network of food and, food and beverage professionals um, who come together to, and it's, it's mainly focused on sobriety. And, you know, for those of us who have had some time of sobriety, you know, kind of talking about how we do it and how we continue to maintain in the restaurant and hospitality, um, our own communities and continue to, to find success there or show up every day, even find failure, all of the above. Um, and, you know, some of the tools needed to do so, but it's really just a group of people who are sharing those experiences. And, and my introduction to Ben's Friends, I was familiar with them and had been watching and checking it out, but none of, there were no local meetings and there was not a, an online meeting until a pandemic hit. So uh, when Chef uh, Gabe, uh, another common friend of ours, when Chef Rucker came to Austin for a hot luck, uh, we went for a run. He's a, he's a runner as well. And we left that run. We, we knew each other, uh, not as well as we know each other now, but we knew each other a bit. We went for a run. And then when he left that run, he called Mickey Bass, the, one of the co-founders of Ben's Friends, was like, this is your, this is your next chapter. It's gonna be awesome. This is your guy. And within a few weeks, Steve Palmer was here with the crew and we were setting up a Ben's Friends and Rucker came down and we did a, we did a Ben's Friends meeting here. And it's every, every since we have our in-person Monday meetings and we have our national meeting that I lead on Saturdays. And there's a, an accessible meeting every day of the week, if not two or three. So it's pretty amazing how it's grown. Um, and in just, in, in just four years, and, and it, was, it was founded um, by again Steve Palmer and Mickey Basks when when a friend of theirs had committed suicide, um, who'd been a restaurant professional for many years, and realized that there was just nowhere for us as as industry professionals to go together and and relate and 
um, have a network and share and, and find the pathway to a healthier lifestyle or ultimately sobriety for, for, for some of us. So that's, uh, that's Ben's Friends and I'm super proud to be a part of it. It's a 501c3, um, does great work and looking to keep growing. So, you know, if there's any city out there looking for a chapter, there's a way, there's a pathway to that. Let us know. I think that's a really interesting point you're making there because yes, there are sobriety organizations out there that do do a great job. Um, I think that the hospitality industry is very unique in that we still continue to serve alcohol. We are in an environment consistently that is um, pro party. Yeah. We're here to make people smile, right? We are yeah, working absolutely. with memories, whether it be with a beverage or with a beautiful plate of food. But I think it's really hard for people in the hospitality industry to sit in a traditional uh, sobriety meeting and discuss like, I'm still working as a bartender or yeah. working around food where that is has negative implications in other environments. Absolutely. Uh, and um, I think that that's such a, a big conversation piece. Also, the, the consistency of discussing a failure or a bad review can yeah. also catalyst that ease for access all over again and how do you manage those things, which is Absolutely. why I think, um, Ben's friends is really, really important. And I've faced a few giant failures in my in, in the last seven years of my sobriety and and having the um, a network or a safe place to discuss that is is so important. And you're absolutely right. I mean, other other sobriety uh, fellowships may may have some judgment on on being in a restaurant or being around a bar, um, but also the other side of that is industry people, right? Um, we we don't think anyone understands our lives, right? Like you don't get it. You don't understand. You've never worked 16 hours in a kitchen or behind a bar or <laughs> on a, or, you know, dealing with uh, people walking right in from the parking garage or the host stand and having shitty, terrible attitudes. You have no idea. You don't know what it's like. And, and, you know, so it's like, we, we need this place where we know that these people that are around us, we're walking into a group of people who understand, who have worked those days, who understand what that's like. Um, we're very, uh, we're very closed off in that way, I believe, which I think has been changing. But um, it's it's great to have a, a community of like-minded people. It, it really it forces it, it. It allows you actually to be more open, uh, a little more vulnerable. You know, it's it's interesting. I've I haven't had a drink in three years. Um, it I found that the alcohol mixed very poorly with my SSRIs, which mm -hmm. for those folks out there who don't know what that means, that means your mental health medicine. Um, mm -hmm. I call them crazy pills um, and I'm comfortable saying that. So um, I think it's it's really interesting, especially being in the hospitality industry, being at offsite events where we're cooking for large quantities of folks, right? I like to call it the grazing festivals where people come up, yep. and they have a glass in one hand and they're shoveling food in with the other and it's really kind of difficult to be at those events um once you stop drinking and you know recreating your existing options at your place of business that has really great unique non-alcoholic options that taste great that make the guest feel comfortable and don't make them feel ostracized because to be frank mm -hmm. you can only drink so much sparkling water at an event yeah, it's true. You only have so many Topo Chicos. Oh my God, it becomes too much. Yeah. Or you can only have so much sweet soda. Or, and you're right, like, you know, we, the way we look at beverage now is we, we fold the non alcoholic beverage or the, or the zero proof beverages straight into our menu, um, whether it's at our bar or at our restaurant or even our newer virtual company. And we don't, we don't, we try not to make it this whole thing. We don't, you know, we, we use very specific language around it to make you feel like you are just partaking in a beverage experience, that ritualistic behavior, but you don't need to have alcohol in that beverage. And that beverage can be thoughtfully created with amazing ingredients, fresh juices, um, whatever it may be. And now more and more um, companies have, have, have started doing actual um, distilling of, of, of zero proof products that you can use in drinks too to give you that texture of that body. I personally am not a big fan of them, but that's just me. Um, and 
but it's just giving more people, it's just normalizing the behavior of not drinking while being out, which I think is great. You know, it's not, not at no point do I want to force anything on anyone, but what I do want to do is be someone who can offer other options. If so, if you so choose. Yeah. And I think, you know, for, for myself, I do with certain flavor components of things. So it's really been nice to have people like the NA beer quality, for example, has gone up, I would say a thousand yeah. of quality, right? Like okay. you can't, it, it's become a whole new game where the, it feels proper on your palate. So it doesn't yeah. feel like you're having something that, that you, you know, doesn't, it, it's, it's hard to, the fat content that would normally feel yep. like that, that viscous fatty content that mm -hmm. it on your palate, if you were to have a Negroni, you know, mm -hmm. and you can you can achieve those things nowadays with the thought process that's been going through for those folks who do miss the flavor but know that they don't want the right the the benefit the added benefits or what people like to call it <laughs> yeah, so absolutely so you you've been really like commodore let's talk about the commodore run club and commodore yeah. you got okay the, they're intertwined so they if you are start with the run club or you want to start with commodore restaurant which either you choose um, I mean, they, they, they kind of go hand in hand. So I, I began, um, we built um, Commodore over the 2018 and opened in April 2019. So um, when we opened, we had almost a full year of regular restaurant service before this, we shut down for, for our, our pandemic um, and um, have reopened since, um, gratefully. Um, when we began the the restaurant you know we were doing typical restaurant opening things which is spending the entire day in a kitchen without windows and um we're like we just we need to get outside so um as someone who in my you know several years of sobriety at this point who had open and closed a restaurant um and had tried to do that restaurant that restaurant was bonami which is, is no longer but in doing that restaurant try to do things a bit differently learned a lot of lessons um, on, on the actual practice, the idea of doing something differently, um, and the practice of doing it. And when we were, we were opening this restaurant, it was very important to me, like, y'all, we have to get outside. We just, we have to get under the sun, no matter what. And so what we started, we began doing is we began just running a couple miles. And there was just a few of us to start. And then when, you know, the world of social media and Instagram and uh, which we're all very active on, we started um, hashtagging like Commodore Run Club. And before we knew it, we had people hitting us back saying, hey, is this a chef thing? Is this, a, and we're like, no, but come on. And, you know, one of, uh, I think kind of like my, not, I think, you know, my co-captain at this point is uh, James Robert, who's a, a, um, the owner of, of a restaurant, a Southern restaurant here called Fix, which is an amazing restaurant. He started running with us really consistently. And then some of his staff and then more of our staff would join. And before we knew it, within a month or so, we had actually like, been like, all right, let's organize this. Let's do this, this day of the, you know, these days of the week at this time, this distance, this route, and let's put it out there. And today now, which is almost two years later, uh, we have, you know, a few hundred people who have run with us um, we have 60 plus core members at any time you can find one of those 60 members over over a monday wednesday or friday run at 10 a.m we do a 5k it's casual we have some people who have gone from couch to marathon we have some people who've gone from marathon to ultra um we have some people who had never run before are now running six minute miles we have some people who had never run before who are still running 13 minute miles. And we have everything in between. We start together, we end together. And basically what, we, what we're doing is we're, ship, we're creating a place. Our tagline is shift the post shift, right? Which our post shift culture is after work to go out and commiserate or build camaraderie over, um, over our shift and, and connect with other people in other restaurants to do so, right? So that's why we go to bars after close because that's what's open that's what's available and we know that other restaurant professionals will be in those bars well what if we kind of gave another option again we're not trying to take away bars bars are important uh bars are my <laughs> bars are my livelihood right uh when, but we want to offer another option so in the shift the post shift we're saying hey this is a pre-shift hang so we can hang out at 10 a.m. It's not super early. A lot of run groups and run clubs are like 5, 6, 7 a.m. This is 10 a.m. You can work, you can get some sleep. 
and uh, you go for a run and it's 5k so it's manageable and we the amount of friendships and conversations and work related um interactions that happen is it, it's awesome and then we, we do taco runs and biscuit runs we have a biscuit run this friday um we're all going to run and then we'll end it fix and we need to shove our face full of amazing, amazing biscuits. So we've done, uh, we're working on a dumpling run with, uh, with one of our uh, chefs who does, who does amazing Chinese food and, and just things of that sort. So it's been a lot of fun. That's awesome. So yeah, I, I'd love you to talk about the restaurant. I mean, you, you have a very varied culinary history, you know, pastry, traditional Japanese and Commodore is distinctly unique. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a. I would definitely say it's far from those, <laughs> those two beginning roots. Oh, you far just froze. Those. There we go. You're back. Um, so, can you talk a little bit about Commodore? How it came to be? Um, mm -hmm. What What was the catalyst for that? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, so, um, Commodore is a Mexican restaurant. Um, we draw roots of Mexican cooking from from all over Mexico. Um, we um, built a restaurant. I joined the project um, after the plans for the restaurant had been had been decided upon. Um, I was brought in to design the kitchen and do some culinary consulting. Um, I then quickly had an uh, had an opportunity to join the the, the partnership team and the ownership team uh, before we even you know put one material down. Um, when we did so, when I did so, we began to build the building. We have a, a, an amazing architect that his name's Tom Kundig from the Olson Kundig. Um, suite in, in, in Seattle who did our architecture and we have we use a local architect to do the build out um, so they were responsible for the architectural design and, and in doing so we got we drew a lot of inspiration um, from uh, a famous Mexican architect named uh, Luis Patagon spent some time in Mexico researching his 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 work and and eating and, and enjoying the food now the restaurant design Ford restaurant was not designed to be a Mexican restaurant however, we really felt through the architecture, through the space and what, the, what we were really enjoying um, eating and sharing that this was the direction that we wanted to go. Um, I myself am half Mexican, have Mexican roots, grew up on the, you know, in, in McAllen, Texas and Mercedes and, and, and all over the Rio Grande Valley um, and have imbibed and, and, and enjoyed not only Mexican food, but Mexican culture my whole life. Um, but that wasn't really the, the, the inspiration for the restaurant. The inspiration for the restaurant was Mexico City. The inspiration for the restaurant was, was um, the architecture and, and the culture and the food. And so we, we, we hired a, a staff and we um, hired restaurant and, and culinary professionals with, with passion and experience for Mexican cuisine and Mexican food. And we led that staff to, to create Comedor and we still run Comedor as it is today. Uh, we have had some turnover in, in that uh, culinary staff. Um, and that's something that we've dealt with. Um, very public story about, about some, some harassment issues that happened in our restaurant. And, and as soon as we caught wind of that, we, we, we pushed through that. And we are still very proud to, of our restaurant here at Comador and, and proud of what we're doing here and, and rebuilding our culture every day, a uh, little bit at a time. And you, you know, you, you've always been mentoring people. I mean, there's, there's tons of people who've worked with you in the past. And, and it's like, I think for me, that's one of the best things in all the events that you and I have ever done together. You always had people with you that were learning, growing. And you, I never saw you with the same person at any event. You were always giving somebody else the opportunity to come, to grow. And I, and I distinctly remember you sending one of your team over to me with food and the, the exact response for the exact verbiage from them was, can we swap? Chef wants me to swap with you because I, he says, I have to try this. And he comes over. And at that point it was a, a gentleman that came that you had brought. And I think we were in, I think we were at Sobe that time and he did a Passover and I said, of course, and he did a Passover. And, and it was interesting because they'd stop and they'd look, can you tell me what it is? Because I want to make sure I respond properly to chef and communicate. And I thought that that was a really, really important thing because when we go to those events, they can be overwhelming and you're completely bombarded by the guests. And sometimes you don't have that opportunity to let that staff member go. 
And I thought it was really great that that was a, because it was bombing. I mean, it was big. <laughs> not like, you know, at the tail end and everybody's got the dregs, you know, and it was that I thought was really powerful because you wanted them to see and experience different food from different people. And that is a really, really important part of, of I think, growing a team, mentoring the next generation. I think um, I'm really, that, that will always sit with me, you know, as a very important moment because, you know, it, it's fun. It's fun when you can play that game with people and share Z's and, and, and education. Absolutely. And, and that actually kind of sparked, and you had one of our stages uh, or one of our chef's stages in, in your kitchen shortly afterward, and that sparked this like idea of our stage program, which is not a new idea by any means, uh, but in Austin it was. And, and part of the, um, one of the benefits of, of working at Uchi, which is something we, we, we'd created this program where we would send you on a stage, we would pay your, we'd pay a trip and we would pay your, you know, pay you your salary while you were gone. Even if you're an hourly employee, we'd take the average of what you did. So it's really important to us. It's something they still do to this day. Um, and getting that, getting that experience is, is so important, but obviously on often un inaccessible for, for young cooks. Um, so we, we help facilitate that, but that specifically, you know, even if you can't, figure out a way to, or even if you don't have a restaurant that can back you to do a stage across the country and, and try new food, um, even going to an event, stopping everything and saying, hey, let's make sure that these young cooks um, are, and I say young and experienced, not young in age, uh, these young cooks are walking around, they're seeing what's happening, they're meeting the chefs, they're speaking to them. I mean, I've met so many people through events, right? I've, I've been able to go and travel and and make sure that I'm there for a reason. Yes, it's often you're, you're, you're kind of starting to touch on a point. You'd said this earlier too, like these events are, are typically not geared to the chef networking during the event, right? It's like, okay, we have this after party. We're all going to get wasted. It's going to be crazy. It's going to be a party. And we've done that. We did that really well oh, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all over the country. But like during the event, like when we are in our zone and we're in the, we're in mode and we're like creating the, or like cooking the food that we've created and tasting it and having the opportunity to share these things. That's like such a, another important part, which actually caused me to be part of a, a new event that we're doing here in Austin called field guide festival, um, where kind of taking cues from feast and hot luck, where it's more about celebrating the chef, and the chef process and the farmer and, and, um, where the food comes from. Right. And it, being able to enjoy that experience, from a guest perspective, because I think so often we're like, we're trapped in the, not trapped, sorry. We're in these kitchens um, and we're working and we're just putting food on a plate, putting food on a plate. We have this creative process. We can have these amazing experiences, but more times than, than not, we're like just in this repetitive motion of like, okay, execute, 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 execute. And we don't get so the opportunity. We live life like this. We have mm -hmm. blinders on. And it's yeah, absolutely. Outside, it's like, whoa, man, where? Yeah. And that's always, and experience. that's always that moment where you're like, shit, why didn't I think of that? Or damn, they, they got, they got that one. How did they figure that out? Right. Those are the moments that I love. For sure. And you, you mentioned earlier, like Sam Mason and Stu Pac, And then we talked about Rucker for a minute. Like these are chefs that in my career that I always looked up to and, and through events and through travel and through being, you know, encouraged to speak to people and meet people which i try to do for for other cooks and chefs as well like i was able and you like a, able to forge these relationships and and use them or you know have them so that not only did we form friendships but we have these professors professional network uh, all over the country where we can go and we can travel we can send people to stage we can eat food we can sit in restaurants and we can have that experience from the other side that's like creating and fueling this passion that we all naturally have, right? And then that keeps us going. But it also creates a brain trust, a shareable brain trust that a lot of people don't talk about. I think as we build those friendships globally, right, with our peers or people we may have looked up to in the past who are now some of our greatest friends, we have the option to say, hey, man, this isn't working right. What am I doing wrong? Have you had success with this? And it mm -hmm. gives a brain trust, a conversation piece to get something working that maybe we missed or didn't understand. And I think that has been a really fun uh, growth part of, of getting older, 
<laughs> right? Yeah. Like, you know, there's something to be said with putting your ego aside and asking for help. Mm -hmm. When you can ask for help from people that you have the utmost respect for, it creates such a unique, um, a, not only a, a unique opportunity, but a unique bond of, sure. of culinary professionals all over the globe. Yeah. And I mean, you touch on it. So most of it is dropping the ego and saying like, Hey, I can learn from this. I can, I can reach out to this person and they're going to, they're going to lift, lift me up or vice versa. And, you know, I, I recently um, created this, the, the journal that, um, that actually you have one in your hand and you, you, you posted about it on your social media. Um, and to see like people like you and Matthew Jennings and Dave Rucker and, you know, these chefs who I, who, um, I have, I do have personal friendly relationships with, but people I also look up to, um, you know, people I look up to who have been open about their journey and through mental health or sobriety or physical health and, and changes there because, you know, me, I've had to do all three, all of those changes, right? Um, we all have. And to see them like supporting that idea and be like, this is great. This is something we need, you know, when we can, we can create tools and we can share ideas about how and why restaurants work, but we can also create tools and share ideas and have networks of how we get better as people because we trust each other. And we know that, that we're all here for the, we've removed the ego from that. And we know we're all here for the same end goal, which is to remain and, and to, to, to have some happiness, some balance and some success. Right. And I think that's really, really, I mean, amazing what you've created right here. So if somebody wants to get, um, a Mies notebook, mm -hmm. where, whereabouts can they get one? I have a website, I have a website that really just has that on it. Perfect. <laughs> Chef, <laughs> uh, you can go right to my, to the, my Instagram page. Here we go. Article. This is probably yeah. easier to read. Is that better? Yeah. yeah. There we go. You go right, you go right in my, uh, Instagram, uh, bio. There's a link or, or chef But, um, so I'm not trying to plug. No, no, no. But uh, I, I think <laughs> it's really important because like, look, how many chefs, okay, let's be honest. When we started in this game, right? We didn't have this, right? right? So everything that we had to learn from, to grow with revolved around this. Notebooks, yeah. Analog. I guarantee you, you are just <laughs> like myself where you have shelves of them, right? Shelves. My shelf is absolutely. You can yes. see this, that corner like right up there, yep. <laughs> full of them. Absolutely. And there's, there's more everywhere. So, and you can always go back to it and research for it. And I think that yes. is such a powerful thing because you have better recognition, better memory when you write it down. Mm -hmm. It's a known fact. And we used to draw pictures. Remember when we used to draw, draw pictures? Yeah. It was fun. Is, draw your stage. Which is why. Oh, I, I love it. <laughs> which is why like in that, in that specifically, in that notebook specifically that um, I created, I have, you know, the, the left page is dotted with like this little template so you can draw around plates because you, remember I was like running around looking for a jar lid to make a perfect circle so you can sketch a plate. But I have that template in there already. So you don't have to run around looking for a jar lid. Uh, <laughs> Um, and being able to sketch that and, and, and not only sketch food, but sketch ideas, drinks, whatever it may be. Um, yeah, no, ab absolutely. And those notebooks, yes, I have them to this day. But many of us do. They're on a, on a shelf just like that. And I do research them. I mean, you do go back. And even if it's not to like uh, look for a specific recipe or sketch, it's just to kind of be refreshed and excited and like look at some of that old shit. And like, oh, man, that was crazy. Or what a, man, did what I put a, much shit on the plate back then? Yeah, yeah for <laughs> Most sure. of what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> so we didn't have we didn't have all the we didn't have all the quick snap photos. No. Oh man, I think about that a lot, you know. And it's um, menus is another one. Like you never really knew what anybody else was doing anywhere, but it's just yeah. the internet, right? Until you got your food arts magazine. Uh huh which you would fight over if there was an extra one that came into the restaurant. Uh -huh. yeah. uh -huh. Or it was somebody had traveled to a restaurant, your chef or someone, and, take it. and they took a copy of the menu and everything, physical menu. and everybody wanted to make photocopies of it. Right. Yeah. Um, totally. It, and I think those are, those are powerful times. Like it really created a, um, a desire to learn. And it's interesting. I think that and I'll say this, and you, you can disagree with me if you want. 
I think that there was more unique things happening then than there is now. And let me, mm -hmm. let me finalize that because, and, I, and I'll bring it right back to skateboarding. Rodney Mullen is the perfect example of that. Rodney wasn't around anybody else and he wasn't told parameters that he had to follow, yep. right? And he created tricks that nobody could even have envisioned because there was nothing for him to base it off of. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the stuff when we were starting to cook, we didn't have access to the videos, the mm -hmm. internet. It was cookbooks with pretty shoddy pictures. I think the only mm -hmm. cookbook for me to date that still was the most important. If is it, are you going to pull out a Trotter book? No. Okay. <laughs> is that for Ben? Okay. Yeah. Well, even okay, going back further. So this one showed you how to do things step-by-step. Step. This was the only true step-by-step step photo book, right? Mm -hmm. Other than that, yeah, Charlie Trotter, that's a whole other one that was so visual. Mm -hmm. But when it came to creating your own path or thinking, it was more about researching history and making you dig. And it created a thought process where now you're constantly bombarded with things and people feel like they have to fit into what they're being bombarded with. I don't know. I, I completely agree with that. Let's, I mean, think about who some of the most creative, who are credited as some of the most creative chefs, um, especially of more modern times, right? And how they got there. I mean, why did El Bui turn into what it did, right? Paladin, I mean, I mean, absolutely, right? It was- Still it in was, the plastic wrap, by the way. No, that's amazing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, there's, I mean, that's a classic. That's a mentor of a, a what's that? Nothing. No, I'm listening. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And so uh, I'm just saying that's a mentor of, a, of, a, of one of our common friends. But, um, you know, when you think about like the people, the people who are credited with being some of the most creative and, and not even credited, I mean, deservingly, uh, why did they get to that? level of creativity it's like well okay i'm very limited in my resources here we don't have the technology we don't have um you know the ability to bring products in from all over the world yet we have to rethink how we use this ingredient and there's no there are not only are there no parameters but there's also the, the, your push to creativity by limitations as well right and those are actual not limitations that have been imposed but the actual physical limitations like i cannot get this i cannot do more than this and so, you know, places like, you know, chefs like Padon and um, Adrian and, and, and his brother invent some of the most um, inspiring cuisine that had been seen in a few decades at that point due to being locked into this like um, inability or inaccessibility to products. And then you see that, what's funny is you like, kind of find, follow this process. And did you use Twitter like I did? Because when Twitter came out, right? <laughs> And chefs were getting on Twitter. I mean, that's when like a lot, I mean, you saw like Talbot on ideas of food. He and Aki were like doing amazing things. Talk sharing about the head of the curve, right? Yeah. Alex and Aki at ideas and food, totally with their website. Remember it was- uh -huh. Oh yeah, so I remember I checked it every single morning, every single morning. That was like on my list of, my handwritten list of things to do is checking on ideas and food. Like, New York Times, ideas and food, right? It was like mm -hmm. those, I think it's interesting when you, and, and the reason I use Rodney as an example was because he was in a box. He was mm -hmm. literally in a box without windows. He had nothing else to compare himself to and to look at, which spawned massive creativity from within. Yeah. And yeah. There I'm are not. times when, I mean, yeah. And he took a skateboard and rode on the side. He rode on the wheels. He rode on the, tips he wrote and everything that you shouldn't think a skateboard should do he did because nobody told him it was right or wrong yeah and i think now we are definitely seeing so many folks feeling that they have to fit into certain parameters which is not allowing people to whether cook very simply mm -hmm. right and how many times you hear people say rustic food sloppy no it's not sloppy it's yeah. there's a difference right there's I think that it may not shoot beautifully on Instagram, but I guarantee you it's delicious. Right. Right? No. Yeah, absolutely. Or, or the opposite. Like you feel like you have to go too far. Like you're saying, I put too much on this plate or, you know, not really letting the ingredients sing. And then we're also through, through the ability to, with technology and 
and uh, and, and travel, like we've lost some seasonality, oh. right? Like, you know, and, and using using ingredients when they're when they're best for you and best for your body and using them at times that through, through technology and ability to get something from somewhere else and put it on your plate. It's like, that's great. And I love to experience that. And that's amazing. But like, also like, what about what's growing here now that we, that is good, that nourishes our bodies in a way that you can't from, from this. And so we lost some of that too, which I mean, there's room for all of it. Right. But it's just an interesting, it's an interesting conversation piece because I think, I constantly still live. I carry little notebooks everywhere and I'm yeah. constantly writing stuff down. Got a little yeah. one here. I mean, yeah, we got them all sizes. I have stacks of them over there. They're everywhere. It's, it's a weird office. thing. Yeah. So, so what's next for you right now? You know, you're, let's, let's, you're, you're running constantly, which mm-hmm. is incredible. Um, I think it's, I could not do it. I grew up, um, I used to race cross country in, in yeah. high school. And I, didn't know that. I don't think I could do the running now. If um, I can ride my bike for hours, I think maybe because yeah. it's low impact, mm-hmm. right? It's less abuse. But um, yeah, I mean, it's amazing. You know, you're out there having a blast and I watch and yeah. see what's going on. But well, so- I get so inspired by Chef Cycle, which is your, your is, is, has been a huge part of, um, of your last decade, decade and a half, right? Um, and I actually want to do something very similar to that here, um, which I like a chef run, but, um, that's you know, awesome. Just, yeah. That'd be great. Um, but yeah, I mean, we both grew up also on like on single speed cruisers and, you know, I love, yeah, and skateboards and, and I'm finding I'm, I'm getting back to those roots for my balance and happiness as well. Um, not that they ever went too far away, but, you know, making time for it, uh, but running as well. Um, I have found that skateboarding and running are, you typically can't do both. <laughs> well, if you fall down on the skateboard, you can't run. <laughs> exactly. They don't, they don't go hand in hand. They don't complement each other well. Um, but yeah, what's next? I mean, I have, uh, I have, you know, we have Commodore. We, uh, it's, it's going very well. Um, where we, you know, we are in a constant state of evolution. Um, not only with um, with our, our staffing and our culture and our people, but our place in the community. And so I have a lot of focus and, and energy spent on that. We also have a, a, com- a new company, a pivot company, but we don't refer to it that refer to it as that anymore uh, with assembly, which is a virtual events company where we have basically taken the virtual event space and the, the meal kit space and combined them into a really um, unique experience uh, offered mainly in the B2B or business to business world um, where we focus on like corporate team building um, over uh, meal experiences that uses, you know, 85% local seasonal goods from our community and gets them all over the country. It's been really cool. Uh, we've had a lot of success with it. And so that's taken a lot of time and focus. Um, I'm still trying to, you know, and it is, it's, it's, it's something I have to be very intentional and conscious of, of every day, which is maintaining some balance um, between my business and personal life. Um, and, you know, continuing to ra- raise my, my family in the most healthy way I can find possible and find fit. Um, and I have a couple other projects up my sleeve. Um, one that I'm super, super excited about is going to um, bring together some of my favorite things, including skateboards and food. And you'll see more about that probably sooner than later when we uh, we announce our, our, our collaboration. I think like Maketo, uh, Eric Winter Yang in DC has a, has a sneaker shop and noodle bar, something similar, but in a, in a different space and a different, a uh, little bit different, more skateboard oriented and skate shoe oriented. Nice. Um, yeah, so we're working on that. That's going to be fun. And then that's, that's, that's something that, I'm openly discussing, but haven't t- haven't fully announced. And um, that's you know, there's some other things I'd love to do. Another restaurant within this this group, um, another Mexican restaurant, uh, maybe not a second Comedor, but we have some ideas of of, of an offshoot. Um, myself and and the general manager are working on some plans with that right now, and that's kind of where we are. We we created this festival. Um, I'm not a founder of the festival, but. A, I'm a producer of the festival, which is Field Guide, which really focuses on the chef and farmer relationship and 
you know, where our food comes from, um, but also puts a lot of emphasis on mental, physical, physical health in the food community and how they all go hand in hand and how every piece is as important as the other. Um, and, you know, instead of putting just a, a chef behind a booth and ask them for 3000 pieces of food for with a $300 stipend, we put a chef and a farmer behind a booth and we pay them each a thousand bucks and ask them to make a couple hundred pieces for two hours. And then we let them run around the fest festival and connect and meet people just similar to what we said earlier. And it was working and it's, it's been great. So that sounds, those are, that sounds civilized. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it, it was first year inaugural year was this year was civilized. It was great. Nice. Um, but people had fun. You can have fun and be civilized. It's true. It's possible. It, it's gotta be fun. If it's not fun, it's not worth it. Right. I absolutely agree. And then we're looking to take uh, our Commodore run club and we are, running through the steps um, of 501, um, 501c3 so that we can have a nonprofit that offers, um, basically it's, we will eventually offer mental health services to, to, to restaurant professionals, physical health services, uh, recovery, PT, um, race entries, shoe sponsorships, things of the sort. And that's been really cool. And I'm gonna continue to push on that. We. And just hopefully like get creative and think of, you know, the same creativity I love to put into food, put into cool tools for us being healthier chefs and restaurant professionals. Um, like the Mies notebook that gives you an opportunity to check in on your mental health throughout the day. So things like that. That's my plan. Love it. So we like to play a game here. Okay. Uh, no answers wrong. So ready? Mm -hmm. Hamburger, hot dog. A hamburger. Ketchup, mustard. Mustard. Dijon, whole grain. Uh, Dijon. <laughs> okay. Sushi, uh, 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 nigiri or sashimi? Uh, nigiri. Sea urchin caviar. Uh, oh, I'm going to go urchin, uni. Um, crab, lobster. Crab. Isn't it amazing? Okay. What type <laughs> of crab is your favorite? Uh, you know, I like golf crab. I like blue crab. I like, um, I you know, I, I like bolting soft shell blue crabs. Um, it's so amazing uh, <laughs> you, know, you say crab to people because uh -huh. lobster, you've got two, right? You've got right. you've got the the spiny, and you've got the, your you know traditional you know New England lobster. And it's really interesting when you say crab, it's like such a spread category. It's a crab. Yeah, it is. Right? It really is. It's so yeah. huge. It's like <laughs> dungeness. Do you want snow? Mm. Do you want spider crab? Do you want and people <laughs> spider crab? What the oh, you know, no. blue crab, soft shell crabs. It's just like, you, you yeah. want Japanese river crabs. Oh my god, those are so good. Too. <laughs> like are, yeah. such an endless topic, just that alone, right? Yeah. Okay. It's, it just keeps going. Uh, uh, chocolate or fruit? Chocolate. Bitter or milk? Bitter. Bitter. Some people automatically go milk chocolate. I always find yeah, no, 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 no. Um, <laughs> milk, alternate milks. Um, not, neither. Milk no, when it's neat. No, I don't like. I don't do cereal. I don't do coffee in my milk. So when you think of alt, when I think of alternate milks, I think of like beverages, or cereal. Um, I got. I grew up with a milk allergy, and then it went away. I guess I don't know because I don't have it anymore. Um, I would never use an alternate milk in a an ice cream base. Um, I might use coconut milk in creating some delicious food, but. That's the only alternate milk that I'm really going to go with there is some coconut milk um, to cook with. <laughs> so, so milk, I guess, but <laughs> I take my coffee black and my cereal dry. So that you already just so coffee or tea. So I'm assuming that means it's coffee. coffee. Cold Espresso? brew. Black cold brew. Black cold brew. Nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Winter fruit or summer fruits? Ooh. I mean, they're different all over the world. But I I'm gonna go where you are. Where you are. So what's funny is, and and this is what's interesting. I think perception is that citrus is always a summer fruit, but it's actually it's a winter fruit. Yeah, and it's grown, it's grown in South Texas. 
Uh, we need citrus is coming in right now and there's some delicious citruses. I'm going to go winter fruit because, well, I don't, again, like stone fruits are kind of in the summer, going into fall, even into beginning of winter. Uh, so like into fall figs. I don't, that's a tough one. I'm going to go winter. I'm going to say winter fruit. Fruit is my favorite thing. I, I, I'm not a dude, but I, I do like one sweet, which is Swedish fish, but um, I'm a gummy, <laughs> kind of a gummy fanatic. Um, but there's something about fruit because it's so diverse. Everything, every time, and just whether it's a stone, oh, yeah. fruit, um, figs, um, I, I don't know. It's, well, when we think about summer fruit in Texas, I mean, all I can really think about is berries. And I'm not a huge berry fan. So um, yeah, winter fruit, bear, melons. Or end of summer. Yeah. Pasta, noodles. Uh, pasta. Dumpling, ravioli. Dumpling. Yeah. It's funny. I had one person that yeah. said they're just like stay traditional Italian, and then I had some people stay traditional Asian noodle. It's, like, it's just so. Oh, yeah. yeah. Dim sum brunch. <sighs> Oh man, that's really hard. Um, I'm gonna go brunch just because of eggs, um, because egg preparations. Um, I know they're, but dim sum like variety. And I mean, not that you can't have a huge variety of brunch, um, but eggs are so important to me that I'm going to, even though I prefer the probably, if you took eggs out of the equation and you're looking at like waffles, pancakes, uh, pastry, I'm gonna go dim sum, but we can't take eggs out of the equation. So it's brunch. <laughs> I love that. that's actually right. really well thought out i mean it's because it's such an integral part of so many things yeah that's you can't you can't beef or pork um oof. where are we are we in are we in mexico are we in, like i mean um i'm gonna go yeah so ah, that's, that's tough i think overall I will go pork. Last one. You? What about you? Me? You I'm a pork? swine dude. I can't get yeah, it. Of course. I mean, of course. Yeah. I'm a swine I, I, as it gets, but you know, lately more so than ever, I've really, I mean, you know about the whole vintage or antique beef, the dairy cattle that's put out to pasture. And it just, I think that that has some of the most amazing flavor I've had from, from beef ever. You know, there's, you're just a, a properly long-term raised animal where most of the beef that goes to harvest is a year and a half. And then you've got these eight-year-old cows that have been treated like gold for dairy, yeah. right? Like whether it's Strauss Farms and organic dairy or Clover organic dairy, and they're treated like queens, they're going to be beautiful, right? So yeah. I go back and forth. It depends. But most of the time, I'm, I'm swine all the time. Yeah. Um, last one for you. Taco or burrito? Oh, taco. It's, well, I'm not in California, dude. Granted, <laughs> San Francisco is the burrito cap. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> How about I'm from, the, I'm, from the, I'm from the border on the southern side, not on the western side. So you see some burritos in like uh, El Paso and, and over there, Laredo, but no, taco. Taco all the way. Taco, taco. So I, before we're done, this is the last thing. I want you to explain to everybody. Mm -hmm difference because there's a lot of confusion on it let's be honest you know there is mexican food and tex-mex please describe to everybody the difference <laughs> so people get it because i think they're two very distinct different styles oh yeah no absolutely and they each have their place uh mexican food encompasses uh many many generations of heritage delicious food and flavors and, and chiles and peppers and and different you know not only coastal but um you know produce and herbs and fruits all over uh mexico and the different states and, and regions of mexico tex-mex is a very specific um some people would say abomination i don't think it's an abomination i think that people create food all over the world and they love it and i want to see i want to know what they love um, Tex-Mex is very uh, cheese and, 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 and meat heavy, uh, enchiladas, uh, the, the, the Tex, there, there, there is a Mexican enchilada, but there's a Tex-Mex enchilada that's different, which is a rolled tortilla that is stuffed with like cheese and cheese sauce and, and meat sauce. Uh, burrito is more of a California thing, in my opinion, but you do see them in Texas. 
uh, also that you do not see those in Mexico. Um, you, uh, there is, you know, through Tex-Mex food, there are a couple iterations of masa, whereas all throughout Mexico, there are many, many iterations of masa, which is a, a, um, a dough made from corn, the nixtamalization of corn, um, and use it for anything from a jarache to a sope to a tostada to mal. I mean, so many different ways. Tex-Mex, it's very, it's a very narrow scope of that, um, that has been sort of morphed into this like rich kind of overindulgent fatty feeling food um there's so many light delicate nuanced flavors in mexican food tex-mex is just such a little little sliver of that uh yeah is that, is that a good explanation yeah no it's great because i definitely think there's a lot of folks that don't can't not that they don't know or they just mm-hmm. don't understand that there are some pretty dramatic differences and I yeah. when you think about New Mexico has its own version of oh, New yeah. Mexico style Mexican cuisine. Very different, very different. Yeah, very the, different the Tex-Mex, Tex-Mex, Tex-Mex. Mexican, mm-hmm. totally. So I think so that's- does, I mean, so does California, most of it coming up from Baja. That's a totally different flavor yeah. profile and, and way to do it. I mean, it's, it's, it's so interesting. Um, it's, yeah, it's so interesting. But the nuances of Mexican food are, are, are beautiful and delicious the you know the citruses the fruits the herbs the chiles i mean it's it, to to categorize it in the tex-mex um the sliver of tex-mex food that was mainly created in, in texas although inspired um be, uh, from being so close or once being mexico is not even does not do mexican food of justice um i understand tex-mex's place and even celebrated at times um but do not, uh, I, I, I wish that everyone had the opportunity to have delicious Mexican food. Um, Cause it's a, it's, yeah, it's, it's so much more. You know, that was, that was my first job working for Mark Miller. Oh, was it? Yep. But that was, but I mean, that too is, is, is Southwestern, right? Like, yep. but he would make me really dig. He would make me really, yeah. dig. I mean, I didn't know you were, I learned. God. Wow, that's awesome. Well, Philip, thank you. Um, so for folks who want to pay, you know, to come by and visit you, they can find you in Commodore. Uh, and if they want to follow you on Instagram, where do they follow you at? Philip Spear, 1L, 2 E's. And you can follow Commodore Run Club. You can follow Commodore. Um, guys, check him out. Super fun. He's always got some fun stuff going. Um, I'm hoping you get down there and get to cook with him soon. So. Yeah, please. Love that. Thanks. Or again. the other way around. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Chef. Pleasure to, to reconnect today and uh, keep doing so. Thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate it.